So the thing that we're talking about uh, this week is information gathering. So we've talked about malware and software vulnerabilities being, um, you know, major issues in computer security, and the fact that if you um, know what you're doing, you you can often take advantage of a program mistake in a piece of software. So if there's a software vulnerability, you can take control of that software that's running on, um, you know potentially your remote system. The natural question that you should be probably, some of you will have already been asking yourselves is, yeah, but how do I get to that point? So yeah, that's fine when if you step me through each of the commands to run to take control of the system or whatever, but if I was doing it by myself, how would I figure out what to do to attack a system? And that's what we're talking about today. Because um, probably one of the largest stages in an attack is actually gathering all the information you need in order to know how to attack the system. So one of um, the, it's you know it's an important step. So when you're going to attack a system, uh, there's information gathering, which is what we're talking about this week. And then um, you know, later on in the semester, we'll talk in more detail about exploitation, although you have already looked a little bit, a tiny bit of that in the labs. Uh, and then post-exploitation. So once you've actually got control of the system, what can you do with those, um, with that ability? So almost always we're going to start by trying to gather as much information as possible. Because the more information that an attacker has, the more likely they'll actually succeed in um, you know getting access to a system they're attacking, so you know for you guys, what sort of information do you think we'll be looking for when we're launching an attack? What sorts of things are we, are we looking for? Passwords. Passwords. If we can get it. What type of system um, the victim is using? Yeah. So with the type of system that we're attacking, it's very very important to learn early on. Yeah. Yeah. Hardware, software. Hardware, software. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Lists of, of employees that work for a, for a company. I'm parroting back so the microphone picks it up because it doesn't pick up anything in that side of the room very well. Uh, yeah, good points. Anything else? Services. Sorry? Services. Services, yes, absolutely. Uh, so do you mean like the, um, you know, like web services yeah. and things like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the hierarchy of the business as well. Yeah, organizational hierarchies could be an important piece of information, especially if you're doing so, so, um, yes. you know, social engineering or something like that. It could be very powerful to be able to impersonate someone with authority. This, yeah, could be very helpful. Anything else? How people who are no longer working for the company might have information. Ex employees, yeah, could be, could, so targets of an attack, basically, you're saying that you could actually target them. People that you can get information from. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. So that's all good. All good ideas. So you know, as you said, all sorts of information that might be useful in a social engineering attack. We're going to look for network ranges. So something that you didn't mention are things like IP addresses. So you know, before we can actually start talking to a system, we need to know where it is to, in order to start talking to it. So we need like names of systems and IP addresses of systems. Uh, so we basically need to build up a list of computers that are targets for our attack. Um, finding any attack surface that we can. So an attack surface is basically anything that we can interact with. Because if there's something that we can talk to, there's a chance that maybe we could maliciously do something that they're not expecting. Um, so, that, so that's what the what, the term attack surface means just something that you can talk to because as soon as you can talk to it, there's a potentially, um, you know, they may have made a program mistake in that software or made some kind of um, configuration error or anything. So everything that we can find is useful. And, it, you know, as you said, services are, are very important. So we're trying to find out as much as we can about all the different ways that we can talk to those computers. So if there's web service there, if there's an FTP server, we just want to find out everything that we possibly can about it. Um, and once we know what services there are, we might actually be able to start getting more information out of those services. 
So in some cases, you might actually be able to find out what usernames are on the system. You might be able to find out the names of computers on their network, things like that. So it's like after you find out about the systems that are there, you might actually be able to gather extra information from those systems. So you can broadly divide it into two different things. There's passive and active um, information gathering. So passive information gathering is where you actually don't do any direct interaction with the company that you're investigating or with this, the, the person that you're thinking of attacking. So for example, if you look up, if you're Googling stuff for like their organizational hierarchy, you could probably find all of that information without actually talking to any of their servers. You could find it all off Google Cache or something like that. So you can find a lot of information without doing any, doing any direct interaction with their systems. And for the people being attacked, there's pretty much no way they can detect that. If you're not talking to any of their services, you're not talking to any of their employees, you're completely you know, doing something separate, so you're using Google and other public resources to find out information about them. Um, you know, job ad adverts to see lists of software that, they're, that they use, because if they're advertising for someone to do um, you know, Apache Tomcat, then there's a pretty good chance that that's what their servers are running. Um, and then there's active information gathering. So that's when you actually start interacting with their systems. So you actually connect to their web server and start querying it for things. Um, often the kinds of queries you do for information gathering are still very hard to detect because you haven't actually started an actual attack yet. You're still just gathering information about that system. So that might be as simple as browsing their website and reading the source code, uh, you know, the, the HTML code that's coming back to you and the JavaScript and you're looking at just the stuff that's there. Uh, you might connect to their FTP server. Um, but you're still not actively trying to attack it. You're just connecting and seeing, you know, see what you can see, see what's there. So it's still very hard to detect that an attack's underway. There might be some things that flag suspicious behavior. So, for example, you connect to every single service they have in a very short amount of time. That might flag something up. But realistically, they're not likely to bother to react to something like that. So it's, it's, at this stage, you're just gathering information and probably acting within the law. Um, so to break those steps up, you've got footprinting, which is mostly passive identification of network ranges and information about the organization. So you know all of those things where you, you're not doing any active thing, anything active. And scanning is mostly uh, the active phase where you're actually identifying IP addresses, finding ports and services, um, and enumeration is that next stage where you've got that information and now you start talking in more detail to those services to see what other information you can extract from it. So an IP address, probably you all know what that, what that is, but just to, you know, to make sure that we're all on the same page. IP address is obviously this, this number that represents um, the computer that you're talking to. So it's used in all communication over the internet protocol, so IP. Um, hence the name IP address. Um, so it's pretty important to know the IP addresses that are um, relevant before you start an attack so that you know who to connect to, what computers are you connecting to for your attack. Um, so you're looking for any, or within that organization, you're looking what range of IP addresses do they have public? Which of those IP addresses can I talk to? Um, and a domain name, um, so DNS, domain name system, is essentially the, um, the way that we get from a name, like leadsbeckett.ac.uk or google.com or you know whatever, to get from that name to an IP address, that all happens via DNS. And that happens um, transparent to a user. But whenever you go to a website and you type in Firefox, google.com or you know whichever you, you, whatever you want to type, it then looks that that up to find out the IP address, and the IP address is the thing that's actually used to do the communication. So the name is just for us humans because it's easier to remember, uh, it's easier to to make sense of. But for the computer, in terms of the protocol, in terms of the network protocol, doing the talking over the network, it's all happening but with IP addresses. Um, so the DNS is the thing that give, 
does that for us. So it's kind of like a, a phone book where um, it's easier to remember a name than a phone number. And I guess uh, you probably don't even use phone books anymore nowadays. You just got your um, all your contacts in your mobile phone, right? Uh, so you don't need to remember anyone's phone number nowadays, basically. So they're stored in your phone under the person's name. You look up the person's name, you click that. But the phone itself needs to use the phone number in order to call the person. So it's the same kind of thing, but with domain names uh, and IP addresses. So um, there are a number of commands that you can use to actually go from uh, a name to find the IP address. So dig NS lookup or host are very, um, very good, good tools you can use to, to do that lookup. Um, so just to be to make life interesting for you, NS lookup is available on Linux and Windows, but they work completely differently. So um, so good luck with that. But um, but so we'll be using Linux for the for the lab uh, tasks, but it's not that different, I guess. If you wanted to use uh, a Windows system, you, you know, go for it. Um, but the dig command, you can do things like, in this example here, dig plus short and then the domain name that you're trying to look up. And the short just means not to give all of the information, just give the IP addresses. And in that case, just bam, it comes back with, um, in this case, four different IP addresses that are for that same domain name. So if you go to any of these, it's going to give you the, the leads back at, um, or leads mat, um, website. If you just type it in without the plus short, it comes up with all this um, information. So the DNS does a few different things, one of which is to give you uh, an IPv4 address, but there's a whole bunch of other information in there as well. So the that's going from a name to an IP address, but you can actually do the opposite as well. So you can start with an IP address and do a reverse lookup. Um, and that will give you, it, it, it basically um, uses DNS to find the, the domain name that's attached to that IP address. And it might not only be one. But in this case, if we type in dig short minus x, which means do a reverse lookup, and then an, and this IP address, it comes back and says it's the um, Free Software Foundation's website, for example. So but why would we? maybe want to do that as a security professional? What would be a situation where we start off with an IP address and we want to find out more about it? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, it's a perfect example. So we've had, we find something, we find an IP address in our log file. We want to find out more about that um, IP address, then yeah, it's a good way to find out. Um, so for example, if it came back with, it might come back with an, um, your ISP or something like that. Um, the, the, the attacker's ISP. So um, some of the record types, so if you remember back on that screen, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes back from DNS. Um, so there's A records, which are um, you know, IPv4 IP addresses. Uh, there's quadruple A, AAAA IP addresses, that's IPv6. Uh, C name, which is like an alias um, that provides an alias between one name to another name. There's MX, which is like a mail server, so like an email server. So, for example, if you looked at the leads back at domain name, there's probably an MX record, which will be an uh, email server that they've got somewhere on, um, you know, somewhere around the place, and that will probably have a separate IP address to the actual um, website. Both of those pieces of information would be helpful if you're trying to look for security problems. Um, NS is like the name server for the zone. So um, for Leeds Beckett, for example, we would have our own name server um, because we would have other systems that we don't want to register all of the, you know, library.leedsbeckett.ac.uk. We don't want to register them with someone else. We can manage all that within this organization. So the name server does that. It basically provides um, other names that are like subdomains for our overall domain name. Um, SOA is like start of authority and that provides other like authoritative information about the zone. Um, so for example, who do we host our DNS with within this organization? Um, and there might be contact details for that. So 
from a security point of view, one of the it used to be one of the most common mistakes. Is hopefully it's not that common anymore. Is accidentally allowing for a zone transport, trans a zone transfer. So a DNS zone transfer is when you um, basically allow someone to connect to the server and ask for everything that it knows. So say for example, we accidentally had our name server within Leads Becker set up to allow a zone transfer. You could just connect to that and say, give me everything you've got. And it would come back with a list of all of the IP addresses of like every machine within our like Leads Becker, for example. Obviously, that's not good because you know there's no reason to want to give that to someone that level of information to someone. But for an attacker, that's perfect because you know, like I was saying, if you the more you know about the systems, if you actually have a list of IP addresses to try and attack, then you know it makes it life a lot easier for the attacker. But the reason that that exists is because it's used for DNS servers to keep each other up to date. So if you've got a secondary DNS server, it can actually you know, use that in order to actually request all the information to keep its own database up to date. So the, the type of um, request is an AXFR type of request, and that's what um, provides, a, you know, when you send that kind of record, it says, oh, you want a zone transfer. And if it's set up correctly, it'll say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, because it'll only allow it to certain systems that need to be able to get all that information. But yeah, like I was saying, that's quite a common, it used to be a common mistake, but it's still something that you would check for if you're doing a security audit of a system. So, um, you know, if we manage to succeed to do a zone transfer, then we've got um, basically knowledge of the internal network that we're looking at and detailed information about this attack surface, so these systems we can attack. DNS is... Um, when we actually register a domain name, we do it through a registrar. So how many people in this room own a domain name themselves? Just out of curiosity. So you guys all know because you've had to go through this process. So for example, I've got my surname.org. Um, in order to register that, I have to go to a registrar um, and give them all my contact details and address and phone number and email address and all that sort of stuff. All that information unless you um, ask them to keep it private, is typically made available via the Whois um, database. So um, if you, usually they charge you extra money if you want privacy, like a privacy feature. So an extra £12 a year or something in order for them not to publish all this information. Um, but someone needs to keep it because that's the way the domain name system works, like how the you know registration works. So just to make life really easy, uh, Whois is the name of a protocol, a program, and a, and a directory. So there's the Whois database, which includes all this information, the Whois protocol, which is a way you can query that database, and the Whois program, which is a program you can use to send messages on the protocol to query the Whois database. So yeah, just to, just keeps life interesting, I guess. So um, Regional internet registries are the organizations that collect all the information from registrars about um, domain names within their region. So um, you can see the world's divided up into these different sections and there are different um, uh, red, um, IRIs that collect information about that. So, um, so in our region here, we're in RIPE, the RIPE zone. Uh, but in my land down under, it's ARPNIC. Um, so the Whois program is a program um, that is is on a Unix system. So it uses the, the TCP protocol, the Whois protocol, which is on port 43. So if you type in, say, Whois and then a domain name, it does that query. So it talks to the um, to the actual um, database and it comes back with all this information um, and it's smart enough to figure out which um, you know which of these registries it needs to connect to so um, that this won't work from within our lab environment because you as far as I'm aware you can't tell who is to use a proxy so um, helpfully there are also a number of um, websites that um, 
provide access to the directory. So if the, you know, there's loads of them. Unfortunately, a lot of them are just full of advertising and things. But if you just Google who is database, uh, there'll be like 100 different websites that you can use where you just type in the domain name and it will come back with um, information, all the who is information about that domain. So you, um, you can also do um, who is on an IP address. So instead of doing who is on the domain name, if you say who is this IP address, it'll actually come back and tell you who that it's um, you know that IP address is um, allocated to, so who it belongs to, um, and it will sh actually show you the IP address range. So you can see here that when you look up this IP address, uh, and this is just a grep to just, um, this is just inverts, uh, so it doesn't show you any of the lines that start with the hash, so it just filters out all the comments. Um, so you can see that this IP address is within the two ranges of these two organizations, and if we look here, um, we can see that uh, I think it looks like this one is um, a subset of this one, is that right? So um, this organization has like this set of IP addresses allocated to them, and then this organization has basically um, a subset of those IP addresses for themselves. So that tells us quite a bit about that target. If we were going to do a security audit of that, we've now got a range of IP addresses that we can use to scan so we can look through and see what's actually running on all those computers. So um, here's another example where we're doing it on um, the Leeds, the Leeds Becker, uh, a Leeds Becker IP address. So it comes back with all this information, and it shows us within. There's a lot more feed, you know, output in this. Uh, but it also includes the IP address range. So this shows the, um, that Leeds Becker has this range of IP addresses. So if we were going to do a, an order of Leeds Becker, then we could scan that entire IP address range, and that would be, you'd find potentially a whole bunch of stuff um, that you wouldn't necessarily find otherwise. Uh, but also you can see in, this, in all this information, there's, there's contact details and things. So you can see, um, you know, there might be this might be helpful information in a social engineering attack or something because it would give you someone you can contact, the name of someone who's responsible. Uh, I guess the only thing is it might be out of date information um, because a lot of people don't keep it up to date, even though you're supposed to technically. So there's there's a lot of information there. So a subdomain is basically a domain part of a larger domain. So we've got. You know, as I mentioned before, library.leadsbecker.ac.uk. So that's part of Leeds Becker, which is part of ac.uk, and so on. So typically, each subdomain has its own IP address and its own server. So the library um, could well be sitting on a, you know, the library website could well be a separate server that's running that website. Uh, so if we manage to find library, then that's extra attack surface, something else that we could try and attack. So um, one way to find subdomains is through brute force. So we can basically um, just guess, you know, just bombard it with, with guesses at finding subdomains. So library would be quite easy to guess, right? It's a word from an English dictionary. You know, you could try mail dot um, leads back at, you could try um, I don't know, outlook and um, you know things like that. All those kinds of guesses that are all, you know likely to come up, uh, and there are tools you can use to do that. So there's DNS Map um, will guess at a whole bunch of different um, subdomains, uh, but there's also tools that can do that plus a lot more. So basically, you can do all these things that I've just been talking about. So you can use Fierce, DNS and um, DNS Recon. So those tools will actually automate all this stuff that I'm talking about. So it'll actually go off and do all those things. So we've got an IP address. We've got a bunch of IP addresses. What do we do next? Well, scanning uh, is basically where we try and actively query that machine to find out more information. So we need to identify IP addresses, ports, and services. So um, 
these tools that you can use to do that can be helpful for a sysadmin because if you're managing a network, it can be helpful every now and then to just scan your network and just see what's there. Is it what I'm expecting or have other people connected computers and things to my network that I might want to know about? Um, but for an attacker, it's incredibly important information because if we know, you know, as I said before, the more you know, the better. So it's going to reveal our attack service in more detail. So we're going to see what's there to try and compromise. So once we know that we've got an IP address with an open port and what software is there, we can actually start to look up information in vulnerability databases and things to see whether or not there are known exploits against that software. So for example, we know that there is a certain version of Apache on this certain um, port. Does that piece of software have known vulnerabilities that we could just exploit straight off the bat? You know, so there's just something that we can do to attack that system. Uh, or maybe we need to go to the next step where we actually start scanning the website in more detail and look for um, you know, other kinds of errors. Uh, but that's the first step we're going to do. Um, you know, or we could go on to actually test for unknown vulnerabilities. So we might actually start like fuzzing that system. So in other words, bombarding it with just random strings and things that are likely to, to break it. So, you know, things that would likely trigger an SQL injection attack or, you know, things that might trigger a buffer overflow. So basically we're just sending a whole bunch of random stuff, hoping that it'll crash. And then if it does, then we might go from there to figure out why and find that for ourselves a new vulnerability. So um, Nmap is a, a very nice piece of software that is, um, well, it's the most advanced network scanner that exists at the moment. Um, so this is from the man page. So Nmap's an open source tool for network exploration and security auditing. It was designed to rapidly scan large networks, although it works fine against single hosts. Uh, Nmap uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what services, application name, and version those hosts are offering, what operating systems and OS versions they're running, what types of packet filters slash firewalls are in use, and dozens of other characteristics. While Nmap is commonly used for security audits, many systems and network administrators uh, find it useful for routine tasks such as network inventory, um, managing service upgrade schedules, and monitoring host or service uptime. Um, Obviously, if you want to read more of the man page, just type man space and map on a Linux system, and it'll come up with pages and pages of helpful information. So a ping sweep is the simplest kind of scan. Um, do you guys know what a ping what ping does? Just yeah, does someone want to just like just briefly explain what the, what a ping does? Check you send it to uh Address yeah, yeah. It's a very basic troubleshooting tool, and you just you send the the um the ping request, and it it will give you an echo response. It, you know, it'll it'll respond to that, and you can see that the computer's there and it's responding. Um, so we can take advantage of that if we're looking for IP addresses by just sending out pings to basically to to everyone in that IP address range, and if it responds back, then we know there's a computer there. Um, so, um, yeah, so we'll just see what replies. Unfortunately, well, why might that not work? If the host is set to drop in ping. Yeah, if, they, if, the, if the host is actually configured not to respond to a ping request, then it's not going to be very helpful. And um, so it became common for a while to turn off ping, ping responses. Um, and um, but there's other ways we can figure it out. So if they're not responding to to ping, Nmap's way of doing host discovery does a couple of clever things that is likely to work even if ping doesn't. Um, so it does the common TC, T, TC um, uh, sorry ICMP um, echo request. Uh, it does a um, TCP SYN to port um, 443, TCP ACK to port 80, uh, TCP T ICMP timestamp request, um, which might still reply, it might reply to that even if it's dropping ping packets. So it does a few things, uh, and that basically allows you to scan a network range, like in this example, and you know it'll reply back saying you know which hosts are up. 
Um, if you if there are no routers between or routers if you prefer between yourself and the computers you're scanning, uh, then MMAP and you're running as root, MMAP will actually also show you MAC addresses. Um, so this is an example of MAC address, and it's like the lower layer to an IP address. So once you actually get to um, like router level, when you're talking to a machine, it goes from talking between using IP addresses to using MAC addresses. Um, so that information can also be helpful because um, the first three octets actually tell you what um, brand the manufacturer. Again, you might not be able to trust it because it might be lying, but often it's not. So in this case, you can see there's an HP um, system is what what's being um, you know what we're pinging. Uh, so that could be quite helpful. So you can see here there's a Cisco device. So that's probably like a router or a switch. Um, and you might find out that it's a VMware thing, so it's likely a virtual machine and things like that. Like it, it can be helpful information. So looking for open ports. Uh, yeah, so the the next thing we need to do is actually examine the attack surface. So what is there that we could actually attack? Um, all T um, TCP and UDP traffic uses port numbers. And um, basically what that means is, obviously there's like a lot going on in a computer and this could be multiple programs working, but the way that it figures out which program you're talking to on the other side is which port number you're trying to connect to. So kind of like the analogy is, I guess, ship, a shipping yard where, you know, if you're waiting for a boat to arrive, you're going to just look everywhere or you're going to have a specific place where, you know, that your boat's going to pull up. Yeah, so strained analogy slightly. But um, so when you connect to uh, the system, if you say you're connecting to port 80, then that tells the system you're connecting to um, what program you're trying to connect to. So the, the computer, the server, goes, oh, here's a connection, oh, it's for port 80, oh, that's this part program, and it hands that um, network traffic off to that program. So that's how it routes between the um, incoming traffic and which program receives the traffic. So that's what, a, that's what port numbers are. Um, so there are certain port numbers, and yes, you do need to remember these, um, that are used for um, certain things. So FTP, which is um, you know file transfer protocol, it uses port 20 and 21. SSH is on port 22. Telnet is on port 23, and so on. Um, the two particularly interesting or important ones are um, HTTP on port 80, so it's like a web, web traffic, and HTTPS on port 443. So that's like encrypted and, and unencrypted, basically, network traffic for a website. So those ports are particularly interesting and important. So the way that a lot of services work is via client-server architecture. So you have some server that's providing a service, and you've got a client that connects to that and asks for something, and the server does something, right? So that's how things um, have been for a long time. Um, and uh, it's the way that the web basically works most of the time. Um, obviously, there are, you know, there's peer to peer, peer to peer, which is a different kind of way of doing things. But client server is very, very common. So basically, the way it works is uh, you have a, your web server, and it starts by listening on a particular um, port. So in this case, port 80, and a client then decides to connect tries to connect to that computer, and then there's a three-way handshake that happens at that stage, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and it, say, say that all goes well, the next thing is it'll, um, you know, the server will say, yeah, all's good or something. And then the, um, the client will then request a web page. So it says, please give me your main website page, or please give me this JPEG image, or whatever it asks for. And then the server responds back, and um, it provides those resources. So blah, this is the information for that JPEG image, or here's a website you're asking for. So if we're trying to find what's on a system, uh, we can do a port scan, which is basically to connect to every single port or a selection of ports that are likely to be active. So there are 
65,535 possible ports on any, on any computer system. If the connection succeeds, then the port is open and we can talk to it. Uh, if it doesn't succeed, then it's either closed or there's a firewall that's not allowing you to connect to it. So there's either nothing there to connect to, or there's a, there is something there, but there's a firewall that's basically denying you access to talk to that machine. So the, the, um, the TCP three-way handshake that I uh, mentioned earlier. The initial connection involves these three-way handshakes. So, and that starts off, uh, so this is very low, low level, like individual packets are sent. The client starts by sending the server a SYN packet. So it's got this flag set, SYN. The server accepts the connection by replying back SYNAC. So, yep, you're, you're you know, fine, connect to the port. The client then sends back an ACK, and at that point, the connection is established and um, information can flow in either direction. Um, so, if we're doing a port scan, I guess the question is, how much of this do we need to do before we know that the port is open? So we start by saying, can I connect? The server responds back with, yeah, all's well, and then normally you actually say ACK, which means, yeah, I'm now connected. In order to do a port scan, you may realize you don't actually need to do all three steps of that. So what a SYN scan is basically, it skips that third step. So once we get the SYN ACK, we can stop. We know the port's open. Um, we don't need to actually establish a connection with the server. If all we're interested in is knowing which ports are open, we can stop at that point. If we want to go further and start talking to it and figure more stuff out, then maybe we do need to finish the three-way handshake. But it just it just speeds things up by not finishing it. Uh, in order to do a SYN scan, you need root access because you need to write to the network directly. <coughs> so, for example, here's a um, Nmap scan. So it's a, skin, a SYN scan against Google. And it responds back and it says um, port 80 and port 443 are open. Um, so, and the, you know, that there's so many different options you can use with Nmap, and it is a tool that you really do want to learn uh, the different options because you can do all kinds of clever scans to find out all sorts of interesting information. But in this case, we can see there's a web server running, basically. Um, but knowing there's a web server running doesn't tell us everything we need to know, right? So, what we actually want to know is what software there is on there that's running. Um, because knowing that there's something there might be helpful, but most exploits, like most attacks, are going to require you to know the basically the exact version of the software that's there. Um, or at least, in order to try things that are likely to succeed, you want to know what kind of server it is. So, you know, are we talking to an IIS server? Are we talking to an Apache server? Are we talking, um, you know, what, what are we talking to? Uh, and you know what version of software is there? So one way of doing that is banner grabbing. So the simplest way is basically you just listen to the response, and it might tell you itself. Sometimes it just reports what software is there. So for example, if you just connect to an FTP server on port 21, um, so this is an example of an Australian um, ISP that I used to use, um, it responds back. Um, in this case tells you what operating system it's using generally, like what distro it's using, and the exact version of the software that's running on that system. So that's that's basically that's exactly what we uh, what we want to know. Um, why might we not trust that information? Why might it not be reliable? Yeah, it's a trap. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, it might be lying. So you can't you can't trust that um, that the information that they're feeding you is actually uh, correct. So that you know, it, it could they they might set it to um, it might be an Apache server. They set it to respond back saying it's I IIS just to make it difficult if you are an attacker, or maybe it's not a web server at all. Maybe it's a honeypot. So it's a a, a server that's just recording everything that you do. Um, you know, if you scan a range of IP addresses and you come across a server, you might be actually talking to a honeypot that's been set up just to monitor attempts at attacking their network. Um, so yeah, so you might not be able to trust the, the banner grabbing. But 
it might it might tell you exactly what you want to know. So you shouldn't just rule it out entirely, but just you know be be a little bit dubious about it. Um, so service identification is taking it a little bit a step further. So not believing everything that it says, but actually verify what it's saying by doing a bit of talking to it. Because certain services will act in different ways. So if you're talking to an Apache server or you're talking to an IIS server, they're going to respond in slightly different ways. Even if they're like saying, oh yeah, I'm IIS. But Apache will do certain things in the way that it responds to certain types of queries. So you kind of talk back and forth and analyze the response in order to get that information to figure out you know, what actual piece of software it is. Uh, so there's some software that you can do that. So Nmap, you know, Nmap is an incredibly powerful piece of software for scanning. So if you use the dash SV flag, it will do that for you. And it will do that quite a clever analysis to figure out what software is on the other, on the other side. Amap is kind of came before Nmap and you can still use it. Uh, but Nmap is, is, still, is very good. Um, and you might also get some extra information out of that system. So you might do some enumeration to figure out you know, extra things. So you know, as we also said earlier, that knowing what operating system is running on a computer is quite helpful. So um, partly because if you're using, say, Metasploit, you're attacking a system, you know that you're attacking Apache, and there's a vulnerability there. Well, that vulnerability might work in Windows or Linux, but you're going to have to use a different um, payload depending on whether you're attacking a Windows system or a Linux system. So you need to know what operating system it is. Uh, and the way that you can detect that, figure out whether it's Linux or Windows, uh, BSD or Apple or whatever, is they will handle their network traffic slightly differently because the network stack, so the code that does the networking, is different on those systems. So you can um, basically, similarly, and that can do um, clever ways of analyzing, you know, window frame sizes and things like that. So like, technical details of how the networking is working to figure out whether it looks like you're talking to a Linux system or a Windows system, for example. Um, just you know, relatively recently, there's been a few um, new ways of scanning systems that are quite interesting. So ZMap uh, or ZMap, if you're American, I guess, um, is um, the internet scan scanner. So it's quite it's quite impressive. You can scan the entire IPv4 space in the entire internet, like every computer that's connected to the internet with an IPv4 address, which are most of them. Uh, so most servers in the world in under 45 minutes. Um, so it'll look for a specific port. So for example, you can say port 80 in the world, and it will scan the entire world in less than an hour and tell you which ports or you know, which IP addresses have that port open. Um, and you could combine that with a banner grabber to figure out more information. Um, so yeah, pretty mind-boggling. Um, but yeah, so you can do that. And you, if you go to their website, you can see some graphs and um, statistics and things that they've that they've managed to pull out, and it's yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, so, in conclusion, after we've done all of this, we now know um, information about the organization that we want to attack. We know um, IP addresses of computers that we might be able to attack. We know sub subdomains, which gives us more IP addresses and more information about the system that we're attacking. We've got open ports, so different ways that we can talk to the computer. You know, we might, hopefully, we've got what software and what software version is running on that computer. We know what operating system they're running. Basically, at this stage, we know everything that we need to know in order to launch an attack. Um, so that's how you do it, and that's how you get to get from not knowing about a system to knowing everything you need to know in order to launch an attack in a lot of cases. Um, so that's the end of the lecture.